Welcome to the Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Atchison. Our show is authentic, honest, and it's trusted because everything's connected. Many thanks to those who've supported the show. It's deeply appreciated. It allows us to carry on our work and we hope others join too. If you'd like to help the show, go to thedennisreport.ca and click on PayPal or Patreon. So our guest today is Roseanne Tremblay-Clark, and she's here to share her stories on preserving language, culture, and a book she's written about a famous family member. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. Good. Thank you for having me. Good. So let's start with uh, what we were talking about in warm-up, um, as we were getting the camera set up and all of that, about um, teaching language up at St. Thomas and how involved you've been with uh, preserving the language, teaching the language, and some ideas you have for improving where we are now from where we were. Okay. Um, like I mentioned to you that my interest started um, when the uh, Language Immersion Teaching Certificate Program was being offered through St. Thomas, and uh, I always wanted to know how to write my language. I could speak it, but I could never write it. And, so, you, and your language is? Well, the Wallistook language. Good. And... Um, so that's why I got involved in that. So I completed that uh, program. And then since then, um, I've taught for St. Thomas because they've offered courses to adults. And uh, so I've, I've taught for them. And then I've worked in the uh, provincial school system. I worked in Andor uh, uh, South Devon Elementary School for uh, quite a few years teaching language. Hmm. And then my latest job was uh, with uh, Chief Harold Sapir School at uh, St. Mary's First Nation. Hmm. And what's it like, because um, you just said a lot, I can picture these kind of eras <laughs> of things that you did. What, just curious, what's it like for young people nowadays to hear their language? Some of them might be for the first time. Yes. It, can you paint a picture what that's like? Because um, it, it's a unique experience. Mm -hmm. But there'll be parallels between other um, people learning other languages. But to keep it alive with young people would be so important. Yes, it is. And uh, I think, um, well, there's a lot of interest out there. I think our, our children want to learn it. And uh, I'm not quite sure we're going about it the way that they, that they should learn it, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. to make them uh, fluent. Because um, our language right now is at a very critical stage. We have less than 100 fluent speakers. So it's really urgent that we um, do something. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about it a long time, mm -hmm. and but I know people that are teaching it uh, now are doing the best that they can. Yep. So. And you said it's part of core curriculum, correct? It's a core subject in the um, school system right now. So that would be an equivalent to how French is taught in the school system in a way. Like, yes. Hey, here's your list of courses <laughs> for the day. One of them is in Holistic. So one of them could be French. You know, mm -hmm. I think I read somewhere, uh, I don't think it was New Brunswick, but some other place was wanting to drop French immersion and bring back Latin again. Mm -hmm. but, but when you connect language with culture, there's a reach <laughs> if you want to bring Latin back, you know, yes. compared to um, bringing back um, your language or French language or maybe even German, because it's more than just language. It's the whole culture that the students are learning. Yes, it is. Our language is the basis. It's the basis of our culture. Yeah. Everything derives from our language. Our language is so descriptive. Hmm. It's just... Uh, it's just amazing uh, uh, when you hear it, just just how meaningful it is. Yeah. So. When interviewing your brother, Ron Tremblay, um, he got talking about language a little bit, which was fun. And we were sitting on the banks of the, of the river, <clears throat> which is great. But he was trying to stress the point that this word isn't just like this word over there, mm -hmm. <laughs> an object. It was part of who we are. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to get across that, that difference. Yes. Yeah. So what do you see with, with uh, in the school system? You were suggesting uh, there's another way of um, teaching this that maybe would ground that a bit more. Well, um, I'm, a, I'm a believer in, um, I think, how we're going to save our language is to immerse our children in it, to have an immersion program hmm. where they're, um, that's all they hear all day. And um, because right now, I mean, they're, like I said before, uh, People are doing the best they can, but I think that we can do more. 
And time is very crucial. Mm-hmm. We're losing a lot of speakers. And every time a speaker dies, I mean, they take a great big chunk of our dictionary with them, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah, so. So teach me what a speaker is. A speaker is a fluent speaker. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well. Are you one? Yeah, well, I'd like to think I am, <laughs> but I still, I myself still need a lot of help from the elders. When um, I'm asked to translate something, hmm. I know my limitations, but I can carry on a conversation with somebody. Like I've got nine siblings, hmm. four sisters and five brothers, and we're all speakers. And it's really fun when we all get together and uh, and we're able to talk to each other and stuff. And it's... it's um, that to me is a speaker, yeah. but I still have a lot to learn myself. There's a lot I don't know. Yeah. yeah. With your nine brothers and sisters, who's the one that talks the most? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I think there's a lot a lot of us actually, so it gets pretty noisy when we get together. <laughs> That's fun. I was hoping you'd tag your brother on that one. <laughs> well, he is one of them. <laughs> uh, um, but how interesting. Yeah. Talk um, When learning, teaching young children... Um, there are things called a word bath, where if you expose the, the zero to five-year-old to all the words possible, mm-hmm. that child, um, even though they might not intellectually be able to connect meaning or actions, they will still experience the, the bath of words. Mm-hmm. Um, or instantly, when you described all, all nine of you together, <laughs> it's like, what a great word bath that would be. You mm-hmm. know, it might be a bit of a monsoon rather than a <laughs> word bath. <laughs> But, but yeah. that would be the experience you're looking for for the school age people. Yes, absolutely. That would be that would be perfect, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we got to come to a family gathering, record the thing, and then put it up on TikTok <laughs> or YouTube or something. <laughs> and yes. Get that word back. Actually, yes, that'd be a good idea. So take us back in the classroom then, if you could. What was it like teaching, and what was the response from young people? Was it like, oh, I got to be here. I don't want to learn this, or Goodness, it's about time someone taught me where I'm from. I found uh, when I taught at uh, South uh, South Devon Elementary, the children were very enthusiastic in coming to coming to my class. I think they really enjoyed it. But um, and the teacher who taught there before was Christine Solis, and she taught there for over 25 years. Hmm. And then she unfortunately unfortunately she passed away. So. That's why I applied for the job after. But hmm. she was one that said, she was the one that said, um, I taught all those years, did not create one fluent speaker. So that's why I'm thinking the immersion thing is the way that we've got to go. Hmm. But the children that I, I had taught there, they were very enthusiastic. They liked what little bit that I could offer them. Hmm. Are there any places away from school where adults or children get to speak um speak their own language because th- that parallels the French immersion experience so that parallels how the Société des Acadiens de Vaux-Brunswick you know want to preserve their language because they see it as a it's over here and it's separate and it's kind of self-contained mm-hmm. so they get the culture as well as the language it sounds similar but you might not have the same opportunity to create that space for them yeah I think um I don't know. There's a lot more we could do in the communities, I think, to uh, to make our uh, language more visible. Like just exa- for an example, and um, well, I see in the communities they have the stop sign in our language now, and th- which is really good. And then we could probably incorporate, like I said, in the grocery stores, labeling things in our language, mm-hmm. using our numbers at the bingo hall. I mean, a lot of people go to bingo. Mm-hmm. Um, just those kinds of things. So. That's help, a, I think. That's interesting. Um, so I'm going to ask a really naive question, okay? Um, because it's it's like English, you know? So some people say they speak English, but there's variations of it and pronunciations of it. In French, um, there's, you know, to, to poke fun at it a bit, there's Chiac, there's Nord Shore, <laughs> there's Quebecois, there's Parisian, you know, but they all claim to speak French. Mm-hmm. Um, in holistic language or the other languages, do you have the same variations or that's not how you say this. This is how you say this. <laughs> do you have that? Yes, we do. <laughs> and even even amongst our own communities, like uh, we talked about that before in Nagutka, where I'm from, um, families themselves, we said things a little bit differently. The, peop- the people that lived up, up the road and the ones down the road. So 
myself, when I hear a different way of saying something, I love it. I think, oh my God, that's another way. Mm. It's To me, it's not like, well, you're wrong, I'm right, or whatever. Mm. I just think, oh, wow, that's another way to say something. Mm. So I think we have to support each other. Mm. Yeah, so. Do you have any personal stories of, uh, um, of that sort of thing? Oh, I was at a Christmas dinner one time and we did this, or with a school person or with another teacher, where you get into that dynamic of this is the right way to say stuff, or... Oh, that's another way of saying stuff. Do you have some personal experiences with that? Yes, I have actually. There are some people like from my community they that would have said a word differently than mine as I'm going. What, what wow. was the word? Uh, one one is uh, the word because I say Ibijil, and then some say would say Ibiji. And it was like a difference between families. Yeah, but I had never heard it say Ibiji before, you know, and I thought, wow. I never, I never heard it that, said that way. In that spirit, do you find there's enough tolerance these days for that, how do I communicate with you even though how I say this and you say that's different? Is, is there more of an acceptance or is it still not aware and, and they need more coaxing to get out of the political habit of wanting to be right? Um, I don't know. I... I'd like to think that we're more open and accepting of each other, but I mean, there are some people that really think that they're the people with the right information or whatever, and they really want to push their system or whatever. Hmm. Um, and I find that's a downfall over the holistic people. I think uh, we're not united enough to work together on this, and we all have the same goal. We want to save the language. It's just the way that uh, we want to do it is different. And uh, we've got to be uh, more, um, have more allies, I guess, mm. and as and uh, work with people that have like minds. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask you to be a bit of a teacher right now. Um, when I'm learning and doing my homework about Wollastook, there's three different endings on that word that have me all rattled and confused. There's Wollastookwe, mm -hmm. looks Wollastookyuk, I think. And then one other one. So I don't know if I'm framing a good enough question for you. But I know in spelling it, like trying to write out uh, Ron's bio, for example. Mm -hmm. or, um, and I stumbled all over the Grand Chief of the Grand Council. Like I couldn't get that straight in my head. <laughs> it was just a moment. But are there different endings of a word that denote different things? And specifically the word holistic? As it applies to the river, or as it applies to a group of people, mm -hmm. or as it applies to, in general, a place? Or... Mm -hmm. Yes, there is, actually. Um, Wollastook, uh, that's the name of our beautiful river here that flows through our city. And uh, <clears throat> Wollastook is the place. The place, like it would be like uh, where I grew up, place where the Wollastook people live. Wollastook is the people, the Wollastook people, it's the plural version. Okay. And so. Wollastook way is a, uh, it's like an adjective, it's like describes something that's Wollastook. Hmm. And then they also use Wollastook we, so. Yeah. I, I can't, <laughs> I don't know if I can really explain it uh, so that you would understand it, because I don't really have a, I'm still learning a hmm. lot of stuff myself, so. Hmm. But this leads well into the notion of you have to immerse yourself in it. Yes, yes, you do, and uh, you just learn it. Uh, you just learn it the right way that it's uh, spoken in that context. You don't have to worry about oh well, it's because it's here, or if it's an inanimate object, or an animate object, or whatever. You just hear the proper form of the way it's used, mm -hmm. and that's how you. Uh, I think back with my mother um, when she would say. Um, Najiptuin gut gook, like that means go get me a cooking pot. Well, I wasn't quite sure what a gut gook was, so I would go over where she had all her pots and pans, <laughs> and maybe I would pick up a frying pan, hmm. and then she was go, and I'm a gut gook, gut gook, like she keeps saying. Dad, finally, I'm going to finally find the right, aha, uh -huh, gut gook. See, and that's how that's how I I learned stuff. So, hmm. Learn yeah. by doing. Trial and error. Yeah. Yeah. That also brings up because uh, that was a cultural point. Um, there was a series on APTN called First Contact. Uh, three ladies got together and did this series of uh, three two-hour shows. 
and they'd taken uh, six people from non-indigenous cultures and immersed them over a three-week window and then recorded it and turned it in a six-hour show. Mm -hmm. um, it was pretty clear from one of the elders speaking that it isn't just about learning a language or learning a culture. You have to do it. Mm -hmm. And trying to get across that difference, like making a canoe is not just making a canoe. Mm -hmm. um, playing softball isn't just playing softball. Yes. Um, th that's a different um, cultural experience that needs to be bridged between non-Indigenous cultures and Indigenous cultures mm -hmm. to have the better understanding. So how long did it take you to figure out which was the right pot with all the different <laughs> uh, tweaks that your mother would do? And how many pots were there? <laughs> there was quite a few pots. <laughs> And my mother uh, was getting very impatient with me, so it didn't take too long. So I kept grabbing the <laughs> different ones till I found the right one. Yeah, because it's a lived experience. Yes. As opposed to an academic, I'm over exactly. here. Exactly, yeah. Hmm. Where would you see that? I want to tie that to uh, all the many challenges that face um, indigenous cultures these days, especially with... Um, the dark side of the energy of, of the drugs, the alcohol, the uh, opportunity for employment, all those things. Because I can't help but think you'll be happier and healthier if you're grounded in your language as opposed to trying to adapt into this complicated kind of multifaceted life we have these days with on reserve, off reserve, blood, non blood, mm -hmm. blood quantum. Oh, goodness, it's overwhelming. To just be happy because you know who you are and your sense of place. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a, a little bit? Because it's more than just learning a language. Yeah. I, I wanted to make sure that was included. Mm -hmm. It's not just, oh, I'm learning another language. Mm -hmm. No, it's... Yes. And like you say, it is more than that than just learning to be able to say a few phrases or whatever. It's uh, um, It gives children that, that great self-esteem that they need, that they really know who they are and uh, all about them. And uh, that's... Uh, I've been sat in various meetings, and I, I've heard uh, different um, young people say, I really don't feel like I'm complete, I'm not whole, because I don't have my language. And and that's that's that big part that we're missing, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it, it makes them feel good who they are. Mm -hmm. And um, I know when I'm at a meeting somewhere, and I hear someone speaking a ballistic language, I automatically go... You just connect with that person right away. Hmm. That's who you go to. So um, our children do not really know who they are, not wholly, because um, we are missing the culture and the language. Hmm. But um, I think a lot is happening in our communities, though, to, uh, to rectify that. So hmm. I think maybe using, using our speakers more and our elders, hmm. um, that, that will probably help. Yeah. How, how would we use them? Well, you would. Some people were saying, like, say for instance, if we say if we had an immersion school, we could have the elders come in there and um, tell legends, and they can tell you know talk about what it was like for them when they were little, or mm -hmm. just that because we have a huge gap between our youth and our elders right now mm -hmm. that I think we really need to uh, fill, and um, we need to use our elders more. I think and. Um, in more effective ways, I think. Hmm. So, because my aunt Mildred, I remember, um, I remember her saying to me, she says, um, "I feel so lonely. I have no one to speak language with," hmm. and um, and that just shows you the state of our language about how much we had lost it, and um, and I think just um, treating our elders uh, with a lot of respect and using them to the best that we could possibly get and linking uh, our elders to the youth is going to be an asset. Well, I'm think I'm thinking like starting with very very young children and um, um, maybe starting say for instance in uh, daycare centers or preschool centers where you uh, start your immersion and then you start building it and you've got to do it at a very slow pace, I think. I mean, not real slow, because our time is ticking away here. Mm. But I think if you start like at a very young age and then involving the speakers coming in and interacting with the children and that kind of thing, mm. that will help bridge that gap, I think. Mm. But um, I think we've got to start with the young. Mm. Yeah. Um, is money a problem with any of this? Yes, it is. I mean, it, it takes... We need curriculum. 
We need uh, curriculum developers. We need speaker, speakers who can do this. And then we also need uh, uh, teachers who can actually do this. So you'd have to train your teachers before, or workers if you're doing preschool, mm -hmm. um, your daycare workers and whatnot. But they do have a, an immersion program that St. Thomas offers right now. It's at uh, St. Mary's. Uh, where I think there's 15 or 16 students that are taking that, um, which will enable them to teach, mm -hmm. which is great because we need we need them people too, but um, we need curriculum and we need we need some place to have it. We need you know that kind of thing. So and and um, um, producing materials and all that. So that takes money. You're starting it, not quite from scratch, because there's some momentum, but it is at the early, early stages by the sounds of it. Yes, yeah, yeah. I I really think that's where we need to start. And uh, like they say, and just keep keep building each year hmm. and uh, adding another year like um, with new materials and that kind of thing. What was your experience like at St. Thomas? For? Um, just your overall experience when you were, because um, didn't you take some of your training up there? Yes, yeah, so I've got a social work program. I, I took that in St. Thomas in the 80s. Hmm. And, um, oh, I don't know. I, uh, the, the program I took was uh, specifically for Indigenous students. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really interact with the other students very much. But, I mean, we still had to do our placements, third year and fourth year placements. So... I ended up at the police station, and then I did, what was the other one? Oh, my gosh, it's been so long. Yeah, no. Anyways, um, I had positive experience. Yeah. Uh, you know, went to the police station there, and uh, I don't know, in St. Thomas, I, it was fine. Like I said, we were uh, kind of a separate group, mm -hmm. and um, and it was indigenous people from, there was Mi'kmaq people too, and sometimes we took courses with them, mm -hmm. and then just the Wollister or whatever, mm -hmm. yeah. Around this general geographic area, say from uh, St. John to Moncton, up to Woodstock, up to Heartland, <clears throat> how many different indigenous languages are there? Just uh, Wollister. Just Wollister? There are six communities in, in, our, new, in our province uh, that are Wollister. Uh, there's uh, Madawaska mm -hmm. and Negotka, where I'm from, Woodstock, and then there's uh, Bilichk, they call Kingsclair, mm -hmm. and then Sidansisk is St. Mary's, mm -hmm. and then Wellamugdog is Armakta. Those are the only communities in our province that are able to stop. Okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't mind asking the innocent or the naive question because it's not easily accessible knowledge. I was picturing there's, you know, several variations within that of what they said and how they said it. But is, there's a, some sort of uniformity then through that geographic area with communication. I'm looking for critical mass is what I'm doing. It's like, are there enough people in a certain geographic area that speak enough of the same language that it could create a, a focal point or a center and give you what you need, which is that location where everybody can come together um, and teach the young ones? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think there's a lot... I know in my own community, I can only speak for my own community, we have, we still have a fair number of speakers there. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're probably the community that's better off in that, in that area, is having that many speakers. Mm -hmm. And I know they're, teach, they're also teaching up there um, an extension of the uh, St. Saint, um, Saint Thomas Immersion Program. There's teaching going on up there as well, there, and then the one in St. Mary's, so... There's there's lots of that, but we do we do have a fair number of speakers in my community. When you say speakers, that sounds like it has a special meaning. Does it have a certain status or authority, or do you just mean someone who can speak the language? Well, someone who can communicate and who can understand. Like um, I find uh, maybe after Ronnie's age, you could see the decline. And we find um, there's a lot of lot of people who understand it, but they can't really speak it. We call them fluent understanders. Okay. And um, but <coughs> Ronnie Ronnie's age and up, um, those I would say are the fluent speakers. We allowed to say how old Ron is. <laughs> I think I wouldn't dare. <laughs> well, then I'll take the heat. I think during the interview he he talked about being in his early sixties. Actually, no, he's, got, he's not even 60 yet. Yeah, okay. 
good. So he's I got, jumped it a bit. Oh, I'm going to hear about that then. <laughs> <laughs> he's right around the corner, though, a few yeah. months away. So. Yeah, because there was something coming soon between now and Christmas, I think. Yes. It was a, a big date. I remember thinking, oh, you're going through a big one. That's, that's good. <laughs> because what I'm poking at is um, if there are enough of a certain skill set, if there was some way that they could all get together once or twice a year, they would be the brain trust that knows how to map out what comes next mm -hmm. because they're the ones that do it. But I'm just wondering if they ever have a chance to all get together. See, that's part of the problem too. Like we're kind of fragmented. Um, people are doing their own things mm -hmm. and, you know, we've got some curriculum out there already, but just that this community is doing that and this community is doing that. We really do need to get together and start sharing, mm -hmm. like sharing our materials and, uh, because we're all in this together, and I think we all want the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, no, we haven't done it. There's really no committee, or we really, it would be nice to have a provincial, or at least just a provincial holistic committee where we could sit down and, and map this out to see mm -hmm. how this can all unfold. And even if you could offer a, a story in your language so that we've got it recorded and we'll all scratch our heads and go, and what'd she just say? Here's my story. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> good. So, Actually, it's her story. <laughs> yeah, here, can I hold it for a second? Sure. That's okay, so I can put this here. So begin. Let it lead, lead on. Okay. Um, at the very, very beginning of this uh, project, uh, uh, I didn't really have... Um, um, the idea in my mind that I was going to be writing a book. Hmm. Um, I had a university assignment that I was supposed to uh, interview a speaker. So I ran across that interview in my files in January, and I said, oh, my God, I'd forgotten all about this. I had interviewed her, uh, my Aunt Mildred, um, and I just filed it away. So I, and then I got reading it, and I thought, this is just way too valuable just to keep to myself. I thought, I've got to share this. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember choosing her to be the one to interview because she was easily accessible, and she was always so willing to help me with my language, always willing. Mm -hmm. And um, she's, she's an older sister to my mom, and um, she lived right across the street from us. And then, like I said, I had, I have nine siblings, so my dad would be gone working all day, so my Aunt Mildred would be there to help my mother out quite often to take us to appointments or whatever mom needed. She was always there. So anyways, so when I, um, I choose her, then um, I still have the uh, the actual recording on a tape at, at home with her voice on it. And um, so anyway, so my love for her and my love for my language, I guess, is what prompted me to do something about the material that she gave me. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> anyways, um, she was quite an incredible woman. Um, so, she, sorry to interrupt for a sec. What's her full name? Mildred Paul. Okay. okay, and and is there a um, an ind indigenous name? No, we just called her Aunt Millie. Okay. Yeah. Good. Because Nagiz, yeah, Nagiz is the the geese is I use here is my aunt Millie, and this is my aunt through uh, my mother's side. Okay. Because there's a different word for an aunt through my father's side. Okay. So that's the reason I use that one. But anyway, she was a pretty incredible woman. Um, she um. Uh, she ran a store for 25 years in our community. She was an entrepreneur. She was indigenous, and then she was a woman to boot. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's pretty incredible to, to be able to do that. And then even today's standards, it's incredible. But back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, mm -hmm. it was downright amazing. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then she had um, her husband who was... Um, in a car accident, left him paralyzed from the waist down. So, anyways, uh, she she was like a second mother, mother to us. Like I said, she, she was my godmother, and um, she was always there for us. And um, anyways, they ran the store, and then uh, when my uncle um, my uncle my uncle was paralyzed, and then. Um, 
Oh, I have to stop and think here. Yeah. How it goes. Um, she had to uh, take care of him and then run the store at the same time. And then this book talks about that. Mm. But in this book, it's not uh, It's not there. There what, what, like she had to battle cancer herself in the 70s. Mm. And uh, she had an operation, had to go to St. John for um, key, uh, radiation treatments at the time. And she beat cancer. And... Um, so when she was away, either for my uncle or for her own health issues, then my family would take over her store and take care of it for her while she was gone. Mm. So she um, she had a lot of obstacles like in her life, and um, she was just so strong and independent. Mm. And um, I guess she had to be. And and the book talks about like when she was born and growing up and how she had to move away and get a job <coughs> because um, she couldn't get help anywhere and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And she just did that. So, What kind of store was it? It was just a general store. And it's a, I actually have a little picture of it in here. Yeah. Um, there she is there. <clears throat> it was, uh, yeah, it's, but that, that was the only store for a while but so, and then see with my uncle being, um, being, um, confined to a wheelchair, it was a great spot for people that you would <laughs> see people, right? So they'd yeah. go to the store and he'd be able to, to mingle with people, talk to people and that kind of thing. Yep. And they didn't have children. So I think it's safe to say that all the children in the community were their children. Because mm -hmm. I, I've heard, I hear stories from people now saying, oh, I remember when I was young and your uncle would say, well, can you sing this little song for me or do a dance? And then he would give him a piece of candy. So, you know, that, that, that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. So I think they had a pretty good relationship with the people in the community. Hmm. So. And the store ran for how many years? You 25, said? Twenty-five years. Twenty-five years. Twenty-five years. Yeah. So, um, uh, let me see what else can I say about that? Did you enjoy writing the book? I loved it. I loved it. It took it took quite a little while. Um, I started in January, and then we went to Florida in March, and uh, we were supposed to be gone for the month. Of course, COVID hit, so I come back. We come back two weeks earlier than we planned. Yeah. Then I started working more on this, and thanks thanks to COVID, I got it. <laughs> I got it finished. Okay, so this is fresh off the press, is it? It is. It just came out. Uh, how long have I had this? Uh, probably a month maybe mm -hmm. and I had ordered 300 copies and I remember taking them home and I'm thinking oh my <laughs> god I got all these books oh, what if I get stuck with all these books but it's been amazingly well rece received mm -hmm. um, I've only got like 30 left okay and I wanted to make sure at the beginning of it that um, I gave them to the elders mm -hmm. in my community to um, some of the speakers and I gave them to the schools and I'm hoping that teachers who are teaching the language will use it as a resource because we really need a lot of resources in our language. And also uh, um, to people who have maybe lost language over the years, maybe some of the words there when they're reading, uh, it can, it, it'll come back to them. And there's an audio portion of the, of the book as well where I'm reading all of it in the Willistook, which... Um, I firmly believe we have to have a lot of audio so people can hear it. Yeah. Because, I mean, people can't, they can't read it, right? Yeah. So. And, yeah. and that was Lee Miracle's point. It's an oral history. It's yes. It's not a written history. Exactly. So something gets lost the second you put it down into a word form mm -hmm. rather than the lived experience form from a, a speaker or an elder as a storyteller. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that the top paragraph is written in the language and the bottom paragraph's in, in English. Mm -hmm. Can... Uh, because it's an auditory experience, do you mind reading or, or sharing it in your language? The, this right here, the yeah. holistic part? So, so you want me to read are, it? So the people who are watching the show go, this is how it walks and talks. Like, this oh, is okay. the sound. So they get that cadence and, sure. and the different. Okay. Um, Thank you. I get one you admit, Tatko Kaganum, Nega Media, Kizi Wolastago, Waduet, Tawi Wolastago, Waduet, and it. Nega gizisko hoda ben mejime wala ikpen negot ko bicha gizagim kudat gasigdak yudat ko kagan nstumagunen ali majamachi nawik kladwa wagnen igaliz manwi kazudana junik mosuinok skadwen tawi bolastagwa wadwak 
the ball we could joke on ya yud. I get moted molly yellow, uh, milly yellow sitpin, yellow sitpin. And it just, yeah. So it just says, read Millie's story in her own words as recorded in her own language. She was a fluent Willistic way speaker and talked about her life growing up at Nagutguk in the early 1900s. This account paints a picture of reserve life at that time and also provides a real example of an indigenous language that has gone under a tragic decline. The account is also presented in English for the benefit of many non-speakers who are, will hopefully find enjoyment in reading Bob Millie's life. Hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. That was great. The uh, it's obvious Aunt Millie from your pieces you shared had uh, had some tough moments with mm -hmm. things. Um, can you share a, a? There's many cancer survivors these days. Mm -hmm. um, a different experience back in the seventies. Do you remember or have stories for what that was like for your aunt, or is that part of the book? The challenges that she was faced and how she overcame them. Mm -hmm. She. Um, all I remember, see, I lived in Frederick. I've lived in Fredericton for a long time. So uh, when I moved away, I I still had a lot of contact with her. I would call her quite often or I'd go up and visit. Mm -hmm. But when she was diagnosed with cancer, I remember she was visiting me actually down here in Fredericton. She was down here for some other reason, and she stayed tonight. Anyway, it was breast cancer that she had. Mm -hmm. And I remember her telling me, she says, come here, come and feel this. Mm. So I went over and she had a little little spot right here. Anyways, it was cancerous and she had a mastectomy. And um, um, my sister, uh, oldest sister lived in St. John at the time. So um, after her operation and then she had to go for her radiation treatments, well, my sister was down there for her in St. John. Mm -hmm. So... That worked out really well for her then. But like I said, she beat it. She never got it back. Hmm. So, yeah. And how much longer did she live after the breast cancer treatments? Let me see. She had that. She had the cancer early 70s, and she died 2015. Hmm. So I can't do the math. No, that's good. <laughs> she was almost 95 when she died. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so I mean... Yeah, she had a lot to deal with. She really did, yeah. Hmm. In running the store yeah. on the reserve, um, it, were there highs and lows with the store? Running a store is not a simple task. <laughs> no, it <laughs> how isn't. Do you, how do you get all your stock in? Um, mm -hmm. Were there prejudices against the store being on the reserve? Were there advantages to the store being on the reserve? Like, mm -hmm. what, what would the business side of that sort of look like? Well, um, she talks about... Uh, after they were married, right after the war, Second World War, they lived in Bangor for a while. She worked down there at a shoe factory. And she said that's when all the men were at war, so they hired the women to work in the shoe factory. Mm -hmm. So when they came back, then they lost their jobs, some of them. And anyway, so they moved back to Negutkug, and um, my Millie's mother-in-law lived there, and she talks about how they started selling some items at her mother-in-law's house, she said she had a long, a long porch there. She said, and that's where we would just get. She said we'd buy bread and chips and just little things to get it going. And then they purchased some land in '46, uh, and then they had a house built. And I forget your he was hurt in that accident. It was '47, I think. Anyways. Um, he, she said the Indian agent at the time, um, when they started their, their store, the actual store in 49, the Indian agent um, encouraged these um, people who would deliver the grocers at the store to bring stuff to them so they could start their store. And um, the, she, she names like um, some uh, the, the bread the bread uh, company said used to bring the bread up from Woodstock. And then uh, she talks about Sticklands. They, we used to buy frozen meat from them. And she names like different businesses and they would come up to the community there and uh, sell, sell stuff to them. So that's how they got it going. That's great. Yeah. In 25 years of that, that's uh, nowadays, there's a lot of people, for example, will <clears throat> tout um, making big money, capitalism, fortune mm -hmm. 500 companies and such. 
but many people don't realize those uh, something like 20% of Fortune 500 companies are out of business within 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. It's like go in, get what you can, and boot it. Compared to the measure of success is that I was in business for 20 or 25 oh, yeah. years. I served the community. I was integrated into the community. Um, so your Aunt Millie's business was a success Mm -hmm. um, and almost like the old tradition that it was good to be around for a long time rather than a short time and make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, this is a bit on the darker energy side, but it's definitely integrated into the story. It's the impact of residential schools. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to go there, that's great. And if you don't want to go there, <laughs> that's fine too. But somewhere in your Aunt Millie's life, that had to have crossed the path. Mm -hmm. And Ron spoke about it a little bit too. So... Just a light touch, maybe, so that people understand it. Um, we get it through mainstream media, and often it's it's filtered a lot or mm -hmm. um, framed a lot, and it isn't a gentle experience. Mm -hmm. mm. So more people need to hear what that was like, at least to some degree, so the empathy um, catches how it wasn't a good time. Mm -hmm. Do you have a story or two that you know of that would be okay to share? Um, when I, um, yeah, like you say, that's a really dark history, dark part of our history. Mm. Um, what I um, remember about that is that um, when we were growing up, I remember my mom saying to us, uh, if you see a black car in the community, you make sure you're at home. There was always that fear that... Um, somebody was going to come and take us. And because there was some of my friends who were sent to the residential schools. And um, we noticed they'd be gone, and then they'd come back in the summertime. Hmm. So there was a few families. I don't know how many we actually had sent down to Shubenagd in Nova Scotia, hmm. but I know we had a, quite a few. Hmm. So I was aware of it, that that was happening. Hmm. And, um, and there was always that fear, like I said, that fear that... We were going to be taken away. And I remember my mother saying, I'll be damned if anybody comes to my house and takes my children. And But after I got older and I got thinking about that, I said, Mom, you wouldn't have had a choice if the police came here with the social workers and you, you wouldn't have been able to stop them. And these children that were taken were um, um, because they had one parent who was bringing them up Maybe a parent died, the one, one particular family, the mother died. So they came and took these children. I mean, instead of um, supporting the family so that you could keep the children with the father or whatever, they came and took these children away. Mm -hmm. So, and as you know, there's all kinds of horror stories about their experiences there. And I really think that uh, that should be taught in the schools. It's got to be taught in the schools because there, like you say, so many people don't even know about that, that that happens. Mm -hmm. And it affects the way that we are today. You know, it's it just, mm -hmm. it really does. Well, it ties to language is also a sense of culture and place. Exactly. Especially the connection to place. And that place was terrorized to a mm -hmm. degree. Well, they had no parents. They had an institution as a parent, yeah. you know, and these people go back and they didn't know how to parent. But um, my, like I said, I know of quite a few of them who went. With us, we went to the day school. Hmm. And um, in there, too, we were, our language was suppressed. Um, we were um, punished for speaking it during school time. Hmm. But we were lucky enough to be able to go home hmm. at the end of the day. Hmm. And we still got our language in our homes and in our communities. We were playing with our friends, right? Mm -hmm. So what these poor, poor kids, like I sent as a resident to school, like, they didn't have that luxury. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Your Aunt Millie would have had a different experience with that being older. Did she ever share stories or did she protect the young ones from hearing any of that stuff and not share the stories? She actually talks about going to the day school in this. She says, um, she names the nuns that taught her. And she says, uh, I remember we had a music teacher and she wanted us to sing and she said and me I she said I didn't know how to sing so she didn't sing so she tried to embarrass her she said well you sing by yourself in front of everybody because you wouldn't sing she said I wouldn't hmm. I wouldn't sing hmm. she said so they spanked me mm -hmm. for not singing yeah 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 oh yeah there's a lot of negative 
negative experience, especially with this uh, day school act, uh, class action suit that just came to be. There's so many stories, people saying what they went through through the day schools. Yeah, and send, um, no, I mean culturally, <laughs> We would have been with our elders. We would have been watching, observing. They'd have been teaching us. They wouldn't have been shaming us. They wouldn't have been spanking us. They wouldn't have been. It would have been totally different. You would have been told to get the right pot a hundred times until you got the right pot. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, my. Yeah. The, uh, because the fascination is how do we move forward? So it's obvious there needs to be a time of listening. Mm -hmm. um, so the stories can be told because that's part of the oral tradition and it now has to be woven into the present day fabric but do you have some thoughts weaving all your life experiences and now writing the book which is grounded in another life experience with your academic background with your role as a speaker um, how, for the next 20-30 years how should we all be moving forward so that 20 or 30 years from now um, it's shifted at last and it's kinder at last, and it's unified a bit more at last. You sit right at the intersection of all those pieces. Can you offer some thoughts in that? Well, I think we have to work together on it. We have to um, and uh, use the people who would have the knowledge and on how we move forward. Hmm. And uh, that language is a big one. We've got to get the language back. Hmm. Um, because I think, uh, like we said, like that's the basis. That's the basis. And uh, and I know it's a totally different world, that's for sure, than when she grew up and when I grew up even. And um, so we've got to somehow, <laughs> I don't have the, all the answers either. I really don't. I'm... <sighs> So what's, what's the first thing you would like to see happen then? Uh, separate from answers? Because uh, my question kind of boxed you in a little bit. So uh, what's what's your biggest wish for something th that would happen first? Would it be the young people learning language? Would it be that non-Indigenous cultures um, start to practice more Indigenous ways? Because it would get them out of some of the dead ends that they're in. I'm thinking of the fishery down in Nova Scotia. Um, take your pick on the, on the larger social issues. But there's a pathway to resolve a lot of those things that are more grounded in an indigenous tradition and culture than in the current dominant uh, culture. Well, I think we've got to talk to each other. We've got to talk to each other, and we've got to respect each other. And it has to be, it has to be at the same level. Hmm. It can't be like it's government here telling you, oh, this is what's best for you, which has been happening for years and years, right? We've got to be up here with you. And we have to talk together hmm. and listen to us. Listen hmm. to us. Hmm. Like, and don't tell us what's best for us. <laughs> so. That happens a lot in a lot of different directions. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> and as far as moving forward, like you said, I still think I'm still really still push the language thing. I really do. We've got to get that in there. Because hmm. I think we're going to have quite a few lost lost people in that we won't be able to reach them but uh, it's not too late to start with little ones and then start building hmm. and um hopefully we'll get uh hmm. we'll get a healthier you know yep healthier outcome for our uh, culture in our language yeah 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 and that would make it a happier place yes well my like my own personal experience um because i was not taught my culture growing up so I'm I'm at a disadvantage so here I am at my tender age of 69 I'm still trying to learn those things myself so I I really don't have the answer to how how that could work in our province like because I'm no there's other people that probably would be a lot more knowledgeable than I am in that like I say um, I went to a day school I went to the Catholic Church. Hmm. I had no culture. Hmm. So I'm trying to catch up myself right now. Hmm. So um, We have about five minutes left. Um, what What's the most fun for you these days? Like you got the book out, now what? You're going to go on a book tour and <laughs> promote the thing and become a local celebrity with... <laughs> 
I don't no, I don't really care to be a local celebrity. <laughs> I'm just glad that I did that and uh I did it for the love of my lang for the love of my Aunt Mildred and for the love of my language. Mm -hmm. I wanted it out there and I wanted to share it with my community members. Yeah. And um I'm 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 so happy to be, to have done it. I couldn't have done it without her. Yeah. Um and like right now I'm uh I enjoy my grandchildren and I'm working actually I'm working on our family tree now. Yeah, I <laughs> so was, that's that's my next project. Yeah, cuz yeah. often when you write a book there's four other ones that surface on the horizon so. Yeah, yeah. So um no I'm just enjoying just enjoying my grandkids and our family and yeah. yeah my my like my um siblings there we we get together about probably two three times a year and we actually just got together not too long ago I had a big crib tournament so we do a crib tournament and we have a little family golf tournament and then we have like we have those kinds of gatherings and uh and uh so there's a lot of language going on there eh so mm -hmm. yeah so we do those kinds of things how many grandkids i just have two yeah Good, you got away lucky there. <laughs> Those two. Oh no, I would love to have a whole bunch more. I'm <laughs> happy to have two. Oh, yeah, that's fun. I'm just poking fun. The uh, so, how would you like to send us out? Um, thoughts for the audience? Do you have um, 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 yeah, just thoughts for the audience, or do you have a, a story that you wanted to share that you that you didn't? That we, because of my goofy questions, pulling you in different directions, you know, that it's like, what the heck's he asking me that for? I didn't right? expect this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. But, oh. but did you have something that you wanted to make sure you said that um, that we didn't touch? Uh, the only, uh, the main thing that I that I got out all got out of all of this is uh, the value of our elders in our community. And I, uh, I just think that uh, we have to really respect them and support them and all that. And I think our our present chief and council is doing an awesome job up there in in their good cook. But I just remember my aunt Millie saying, um, like, uh, how alone she felt uh, because she didn't have children, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, I don't know where I'm going with this. Just, uh, I guess, wrapping our arms around our elders and um, just making them feel really important because they are, hmm. they, they are very, very important in our communities. So, um, I don't know who to. And uh, I just wanted to acknowledge also uh, that uh, Chief Ross Perley and um, Councillor Shane Perley Dutcher and the uh, director of the the good, good um, education program, Pine Pearly, for funding this. They funded my uh, the publishing of my book, and um, which enabled me to be able to give it away for no cost, right? So, but I want to acknowledge them and uh, I want to thank them so much for my supporting it. And uh, yeah, great. And I just wanted to say one one last thing uh, in my language to my aunt Millie. Um Gazalmo Naga Manachkunita Hamalo. Just saying that I will love her forever and we'll never forget her. It's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for watching. If you like the work we do, go to the dentist and support the show. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. <laughs>